And without further ado, I'll uh, give the floor to Dan for adaptation without retraining. Okay, thanks, John. So, uh, okay, it's, it's, uh, thank you for staying uh, after the long conference for uh, this talk. So, as, as Slav uh, revealed in the morning, I could have uh, gotten away with it and given a talk on, on our semi supervised stuff. We did a lot for the last couple of years on semi supervised and indirect supervision that can easily be related to adaptation. But uh, I was, and I thought about it for a little bit, but I decided to give a new talk on, on really on adaptation. So uh, that's why I probably would see how many more minutes I need. But, uh, so, um, so this is a talk. So I uh, need to thank several of my students uh, that uh, did a lot of the work here and some of the funding agencies. And, and I want to, so I don't know how many of you here are NLP people. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about the fact that uh, adaptation is really essential in NLP. I mean, uh, it's a tough domain and there are many, many reasons why the domain we see when we train is very different often than the one we actually care about. Vocabulary differs across domains, you know, word occurrence may differ, word usage uh, may differ, word meanings may be different. So just as a simple example, the word can is never used as a noun in a large collection <coughs> of words with journal documents that is commonly used to train a lot of our tools. And we all agree that can is used quite often in some context as a noun. And many, many other examples like this. It's not only vocabulary structure of sentences may differ. For example, I'll, I'll uh, use this uh, example later on. The use of quotes in the Wall Street Journal is very specific. If you read other literature, fiction, blogs, <coughs> other newspapers, the use of quotes is very different. If you get used to one, you may be confused. Also, task definitions for some of the tasks may differ. There's very little we know to say about this, unfortunately, but I'm happy to talk about it. So, so what are we doing? I mean, we're trying to solve a lot of problems ranging from the problem of name entity recognition. I'm assuming some of you at least know. Uh, this is a screenshot from a demo that we have on my webpage. Basically, the idea is to recognize phrases, names of people, <coughs> phrases and names of people, organization, and location, and so on. And it has to be clear that even though this is a very well-defined problem, it's actually a very hard problem because entities themselves are very ambiguous. JFK could be both a location and a person depending on the context. So, so just using the list isn't sufficient here. It's a hard problem. We have to use machine learning techniques. And, and after training on a specific domain, we can actually be pretty good, as this shows. But moving to blogs or other things could be a problem. Here I show a blog about uh, soccer. And you can see that the word Wednesday here, well, Wednesday is a day in the week. And in this context, it's actually an organization, and we miss it. So, so we do make mistakes. Another problem, which is going to be my main running example today, is the problem of semantic labeling. This is the problem of parsing shallow parsing of sentences at the level of who did what to whom, when, where, and why. So given a sentence like, I left my purse to my daughter in my will, we would like to parse it at the level of, I am the leader, A1, uh, my purse is the things left, to my daughter is a phrase that represents the benefactor, and in my will, we call it location, it's an age, you can disagree with this, but it's some kind of an Way. So basically, you can think about it as some kind of a chunking of <coughs> two phrases and then coloring each phrase based on the role you want to give it. And of course, there are many, many ways to do this, and here are some, but there are constraints over what you can do. So for example, this uh, 
is illegitimate because you have overlapping arguments, and in this formulation we don't allow overlapping argument, and some other could be uh, could be violating other constraints. For example, say we know that if argument of the type A2 is present, A1 must also be present. So, so this is the type of problem we want to solve here. Training for this is based on a uh, corpus that is called ProBank, that is an augmentation of the tree bank. It's a relatively large, uh, if you want, structure prediction problem with a lot of argument types. And it's one of the tasks that people have spent a lot of time on over the last few years in NLP. As I said, I'm going to use it later. So at the end, once you, once you train, you get uh, something that looks quite nice. So this is, again, a differential from a system. And you get uh, identification of the key relations in this sentence. This is a sentence here, a car bomb that exploded outside the US military base, killed 11 Iraqi citizens. You get the key relations. And you get what's happening in the sense that this is the killer, this is the corpse, this is the bomb, and so on. Again, uh, what happens if you move outside of uh, your training data? And this is perhaps the most important slide in the talk. I'm going to use this later. So here's another example that seemed quite simple. But when you run this one on the demo, you see that we identified peacekeepers as the verb. Wrong. And in fact, I would have known this ahead of time. The key reason this is happening is because we've never seen abuse before as a verb. This fact by itself confuses the, the processes significantly enough. But you, we would all agree that I could rewrite this sentence. You and peacekeepers hurt children. It's the same sentence as far as you and I concern, are concerned. Nevertheless, here, we get it exactly right. We get that the US peacekeepers are the agent, the entity causing the damage. This health is the predicate. Children are the patient, entity experiencing <coughs> damage. Beautiful. And of course, we can now take these annotations and bring them back to the original sentence. And that's basically what I want to talk about most of my talk today. So. The idea is that I knew ahead of time, without knowing a thing about this, that I'm not going to succeed here. And if we know how to convert it to something that we are more likely to succeed on, we've done something. So I call it adaptation. I don't know if I can call it domain adaptation, because I'm not sure exactly what's, what's the domain. We want to be able to do these things on the fly without having a notion of this is the domain you're taking the test example for. Thinking, think about you know real-time processing of a web data that could be very, very diverse. The key thing is that I don't want to retrain my model. I want to use the same model that I trained on a lot of training data in the past. And now, given a test instance, I want to perturb it so that it's, it's going to be more like the training data. And then I'm going to transform the annotation uh, back to the, inter the, to the instance of interest. So, uh, so before I get to this part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about lessons from standard domain adaptation. Basically talk a little bit about interaction between f of x and f of y given x that we talked about a little bit in the morning. And then I'm going to move to uh, this part, talking about changing the text rather than the model. Uh, and I'm going to end just with a few slides on another adaptation problem that comes up that I think is different than what we are doing uh, and, and very interesting. So maybe some of you will start thinking about it. So, so here is a perspective on domain adaptation problems. So what I show here is, is this grid that x-axis is uh, similar p of x. The y-axis is similar p of y given x. So you have the same task, uh, task in the uh, bottom right corner. And I'm going to place points on this, uh, on this graph. I'm going to paraphrase on one of John's uh, papers. The examples are going to be reviews. So you can think about the point here, which is adapting from English movies uh, to Chinese movies. Then an easier problem would be adap adapti adapting from English books to, to music. And even better, adapting from uh, English movies to music. And a hard problem could be 
adapting from Wall Street uh, Journal name entity recognition to bio, biological data, uh, <coughs> biological articles name entity recognition. Really almost a different task. So, so just to make sure we're talking about the same thing, when we talk about P of Y given X, we typically assume that we have a small amount of labeled data on the target domain, otherwise we won't be able to say something like this. And typical approaches that people have developed for this relate source and target to weight vectors, rather than training two separate weight vectors uh, independently. So often this is achieved by some kind of regularization uh, term, and you know, several of the works that everyone knows about, Shelba, uh, Hal Daumes, uh, Finkel, are works in this line of work. There's another line of work that talks only about changing P of X, the distribution of the data itself. And in this case, we typically don't use labeled examples in the target domain. We just rely on uh, unlabeled data. And the idea is to try to resolve uh, differences in the feature space only. <coughs> Basically find a new representation or append a new representation that brings the source uh, feature space and the domain and the target feature space together. Uh, so work, the work on uh, structural uh, correspondence of, of John and several other works belong to uh, this class of work. So, so back to this picture, what do we know in fact? We know that most of the problems that we can actually solve, and this is based on experiments with Hull's uh, uh, algorithm, frustratingly easy, are really in the bottom right corner. This is what we can do. Uh, and in fact, if we even move a little bit further to the bottom right corner, uh, it becomes so easy that <coughs> just pulling all the data that we have together and training is going to do the work. So, uh, then yeah. How is the bottom line corner defined? What a similar P of X and similar I'm going to be a little bit more specific, but not a lot more specific. But there are graphs that uh, I can show. So, we uh, don't know what the corner <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, at least you know that it's more similar P of X and more similar P of Y given X. Uh, I don't want to commit and put numbers in it. So, but, but the bottom line is or at least one of the bottom lines is that if you're here, there's nothing you can do. You really need to train on target if you want to be able to succeed on these kind of problems. So, and, and most of the work that people have done, I think actually is in this bottom region anyway, <coughs> where P of Y given X is quite similar. So I'm going to zoom into this area, basically, uh, and, and what we can see here, we can see this blue region, and we can see the red region. And the interesting thing is that if you take, or what we found out, is that if you take points that belong to the blue region and apply uh, P of X adaptation on them, and we've done it with a simpler, much simpler method than, than John's uh, mm -hmm. method, just brown clusters, you actually move points from here to the red, and then you can just pull all the data together. So, so I'm going to, uh, so it brings up the question, you know, do we need f of y given x at all? And, and in fact, we do need, because if you look more carefully at the experimental results, you see that there are different regions where you do need it, but sometimes if you do the right thing, you can actually move everything to the right region. So I'm going to give you a little bit more details uh, on what we call the necessity of combining adaptation method, basically looking both at f of y given x and f of x. So what you can see here on the, on the left is a graph. The red is training only on target. So it's not so good. Uh, and of course, when, and the blue is first letting be easy. So uh, it's not doing well when we don't have similarity between f of y given x. And here I'm measuring similarity as the cosine between the two weight vectors, one optimal weight vector on the target one, another one is optimal uh, weight vector uh, on the source. It's not the same optimal that you described in the morning, and actually there's some interesting things, or possibly interesting things there. Uh, but what you can see is that once you become close enough, then, only then, for studying <coughs> easy beats uh, doing nothing, 
but if, if you become very close, uh, just pulling together the source and target is actually good. And, and this is stuff that is done without cluster. Just think about f of y given e. If in addition, you first run clustering, uh, brown clusters in this case, on the, uh, on the data, what you get is you get better results, both with the first thing be easy and just pulling source and target. And you do have a region where the blue is better <coughs> than the green. But at the end, actually, surprisingly, perhaps, just putting the source and the target together actually beats state-of-the-art adaptation. So, so there is some theory behind it. I'm not going to talk about it. But we can prove a mistake bound uh, that show that FE, for studying the easy, actually improves uh, when cosine of W1, W2 is greater than a half. It's a rather loose condition, but it gives the intuition uh, that it really helps only on the right side when f of y given x is uh, close enough. And we've done experiments on a number of real tasks, including name entity recognition, the positional sense, uh, which I haven't defined here. And we show that before adding clusters, in these two cases, f is indeed best with clusters. Sometimes we can show that just putting together source and target uh, is actually best and leads to some state of the art results. Yeah. Did you already mention uh, what is the proportion of uh, source and targets uh, you were pulling? Uh, I didn't mention, and in fact, I don't remember. But it's the standard data sets. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> so you'll have to go to the paper. <laughs> but generally, is there comparable in size? Or you have no, no, there's a lot less. A lot okay. less okay. Yeah. Okay. Like probably 10 times ish. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you also think the analysis is for what? Exactly for what? For, uh, it, it's a perceptron based analysis. Okay, so, so basically the lesson here is that really it's important to think about both adaptation methods. But another lesson is can we get away without knowing a thing about the target? And, and that's really the motivation for trying to think about on the fly adaptation. Uh, so, so I'm going to focus now on this on the fly adaptation, bringing back this example that I showed before, that illustrates that at least in this example, we can do it. I'm going to give one other example. Here is an a sentence. He was discharged from the hospital after a two-day checkup, and he and his parent, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at the past three rather than semantic relabeling analysis, although I care about the semantic relabeling. So I know <coughs> that discharge is the predicate, but mistakenly, we thought that all the rest of the sentence, or the parser thought that all the rest of the sentence is actually a temporal argument. Clearly, this is wrong. I'm going to rephrase this sentence by changing the word checkup to examination. And now I get, still, this is the predicate, but I get the correct temporal argument. Only this part after a two day examination is, is the correct. So, this is another type of analysis. It illustrates another example where this works, but it illustrates another important idea about uh, natural language processing. Some people have more interesting goals. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so when, you work, when you think about retraining NLP systems, it's not just retraining a classifier. These are typically big systems, pipeline systems. Uh, in order to impact the semantic labeling, I have to start with parse speech tagger. I have to do parsing. And if I want to retrain, I have to retrain all of this. So here you can see that basically the impact I made was on the parsing. Well, that's going to help. <laughs> if you're right. <laughs> uh, so, and, and that's really an important point and another incentive for thinking about minimizing retraining. Okay, so what do we want to do? The question we ask is, can this text perturbation that I exemplified in these two examples, can it be done in automatic, automatically so that we'll get eventually better than the analysis? Really, the key question is, can we do it based on training data only? So I want to be able to, given test instance, modify it based on the training data information alone uh, so, and, and the idea is that I'm going to collect some statistics on the training data, and this will allow me to determine what needs to be perturbed in the sentence and how. 
And I'm going to show uh, some experimental evidence also on semantic co-labeling where we train on Wall Street Journal and test on some fiction data and from Brown. Okay, so here is the general scheme that we're <coughs> suggesting in policy adaptation using transformations. Uh, the, the idea is, as I said, to adapt the text to something that is similar uh, to what the existing model likes. I'm going to start with a sentence. I have a transformation module that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more details. The idea is that I'm transforming each sentence to multiple transformed sentences because I don't know exactly what I need to do. Then I'm running the existing model that was trained before on it, getting a lot of outputs, or potentially a lot of outputs, and then I'm going to combine them back to an analysis. So that's the scheme, and the question is, of course, how to do it. So the key step is that we developed a family of what we call label-preserving transformations. And by that I mean a transformation that maps an instance, the, the target instance, into a set of instances, uh, and has the following two properties. Uh, the output instance has the property that is more like, that it's more likely to appear in the training corpus. And this is a measurable thing than the existing instance. And the output instance has the property that it's likely to be label preserving. So I'm hoping that I know what's going to be the output because I'm going to propagate it back uh, to the instance. So examples could be replacing a word with, uh, with synonyms that are common in the training data, or replacing a structure that I see in the test sentence with a structure that is more likely to appear in training. Uh, so, so we have two types of transformations, and we're going to briefly go over this. I'm not sure when I started. So. I'm still saying. Okay. Uh, so, so one type of transformation is called resource-based transformations. Basically, we use resources like WordNet, clusters, and so on, and prior knowledge. And the second class of transformation are learned transformations, where the learning is done on the training data. So. Uh, what do I mean by resource-based transformation? So this could be replacements of infrequent predicates. So I look at verbs that haven't uh, that I haven't seen a lot in training. Now notice that there is going to be some noise because how do I know that this is a verb? <coughs> I'm relying on power speech tagger that I ran on the instance on the test instance. So, uh, but still, power speech tagger is relatively robust, so my transformations do take context that depend on power speech tagging. I can replace unknown words using WordNet, using word clusters, and so on. And we have some sentence simplification transformations, dealing with quotations, uh, dealing with prepositions, splitting sentences based on prepositions to two simpler sentences, simplifying noun phrases. For example, we can identify conjunction and break sentences to two. All these transformations could be noisy, and they are noisy in general, but hopefully uh, uh, they're good enough. So, so here is an example of dealing with quotations. We know that in the Wall Street Journal, quotations are only of the form, or mostly of the form, someone said something in quotation. That's it. That's the form there are. Why? No idea. But once we observe this in train, in training, we can take these input sentences and split it to these three things. First of all, we can take the sentence inside the, qu the quotes. It's typically a sentence mm -hmm. in itself. Two, we can write it in a way that is more similar to the quotes in the Wall Street Journal. Three, we can replace this that could be very long. I mean, here it's a, this is a simple example. With a canonical sentence, we always replace it by with this is good, and we know how to parse an SRL, this is good. So it doesn't affect the overall analysis of the sentence. So this is an example of one that of the transformed sentences. We then have a class of learned transformations, where the idea here is that we identify a context and a role candidate in the target sentence, and transform the candidate argument to a simpler argument, uh, to a simpler context, in which we expect the semantic or labeler uh, to be more robust, the model that we already trained to be more robust. And then we map back the role assignment. So again, here is, here is an example. So let's say this is my input sentence. Uh, the context in this case would be 
a person, auxiliary verb, and this specific uh, predicate and <coughs> and I have and I know in testing that in this context A2 was the golden notation, I'm going to trans I'm going to transform it to a simple sentence that I know the analysis for where the same argument is an A0 and I have a rule that is complex, I'm not going to go over the details, it encodes the context in the target, in the source and in the target, but the key thing is that I know that if I found A0 in the transform sentence, I'm going to label the original one with A2. So, the, 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 these transformation rules, you are, you come up with them before looking at the test data? Before so looking at the test data. So, it's supposed to be good, good for any... Yeah. So is this a little bit like a nearest neighbor rule? So if you think of each, uh, uh, if you think that there's a distance, your transformation defines a distance, basically saying that anything that comes, uh, you project it you, uh, over the closest point, and that's going to be the label. Am I? It's. I think conceptually it's related, but it's it's a very complex way to do nearest neighbor. But basically, the idea is that. I take an instance and I try to map it or perturb it to something that uh, along several dimensions is more similar to what I've seen. So in this sense, it's kind of like the nearest neighbor, only that I don't know how to define it as a metric at, the, at this point, or, or maybe an interesting direction to look at. So at this point, we only use training. The rule learning algorithm is basically a, a beam search triggered by infrequent words and roles that we see in the training. So we say, this is infrequent, uh, infrequent all, uh, words and roles that we see uh, in the test. So, so once we see that, we invoke words that we've learned uh, and do these kind of substitutions. So at the end, I have to put all this together uh, into one decision. And the way we do it, basically, it's, we formulate it as an ILP problem. We have to make. In, in general, when we do semantic role labeling, we have to make several interdependent decisions. So we have to assign roles to all the arguments for a given predicate. Uh, for each predicate, we have multiple role candidates. And we have a distribution from our model over these possible labels. <coughs> in this specific case, in addition to this, for the same argument, I may have different proposed uh, sentences because of the transformation. And what we do is we simply average the score of these proposed sentences, and then we plug them into our uh, ILP. The constraints C that we treat in this specific case as hard constraints, just like we do in the standard uh, SRL model, can code different things for like non-overlapping arguments, verb centers, subcategorization constraints, you know, different information pieces that we know. For example, is this is if this is the predicate in the sentence. It cannot take this argument, or if this is the uh, if this is a type of a verb, uh, it cannot uh, take more than four arguments. You know things like that. Uh, and and I'd like to know that, like in many problems in IL in, in natural language processing, even though ILP is is <coughs> an NPR problem, it's very very efficient. Even for very large problems, because of sparsity, we can do it efficiently. So here are some. Yeah. Uh, so th this is to solve the SRL alone, right? There's no transformation involved, or no, no. It's the same thing. I basically take all the outputs that I got from the transformations mm -hmm. and plug <coughs> them into the same scheme. The only so I so, okay. I, I so you're solving the same ILP for each every transformation. Yeah. So basically, I once I identify the predicate, the standard ILP is going to do this. It's going to look at each right. role candidate and it. It generated the distribution. The model proposes distribution over possible roles this argument can take. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is I'm plugging the output from the transformations into the same scheme. I just have more candidates. And if I have multiple candidates from the transformation, I just average those codes. So it's really the same scheme. I don't even lose time from this perspective. Well, well I you believe run the ILP multiple times. Once for each. No, no, once for each predicate. That's, that's yeah. what I did. <coughs> but, but we did that before. Um, really, the ILP runtime for SRL is zero. I mean, it's, it's, if you compare it to you know, feature extraction, encoding things, and so on, 
it's zero. So, so the influence time doesn't cost. But in, in your rules, you never change predicates? Or no, no, we do, we do. Okay, so you're right. In fact, we may add a few predicates, yeah. So it could be that the problem is going to be slightly larger. Yeah. We do change predicates, yeah. But, but order of magnitude, it's, it's really uh, the same. Okay, so a, a few experimental results. So basically, we compared it to uh, systems, two of our systems that are based on Chernyak pulse and Stanford pulse. Chernyak pulse is a little bit better, but in both cases, you can see uh, quite a significant increase using uh, the algorithm. We also compared it to uh, state-of-the-art systems that actually are based on multiple pulses. So, so basically, what this system do is they add another level of influence where we pass pulse with five or seven pulses uh, and then combine them uh, to support the SRL. So this is uh, one of our systems. That's what we get. So of course, the gap diminishes a little bit because you start with a much larger, significantly larger baseline. We still get uh, about 3% gain. And if we compare it to the best uh, system that actually does retraining, uh, this is the system. So we went about halfway uh, into retraining on the training day, on the test day. So there's still room to go, but at least uh, <coughs> there is something here. Um, okay, so uh, <coughs> we also do analysis on health of each transformation. Actually, I don't want to spend time on this. I want to. Okay, so, so there's one other thing I could have talked about, and I don't want to, but just want to bring up the issue that there's more to be said about the use of prior knowledge in adaptation. Uh, and we've done some preli very preliminary work on it. So ba the basic idea is that sometimes you have knowledge about the target domain, but you don't have data. And the basically declarative knowledge. And <coughs> the question is how to use it. And for the semantic leveling and a few other problems, we did it also for NER and POS tagging, uh, we can actually incorporate this declarative knowledge as constraint. So basically, the objective function we're going to have is going to have the original model, some kind of linear model. In our case, for SRL, this is just a collection of classifiers. We'll have the standard constraints that I mentioned before uh, for the decision task, the SRL. And we're going to have another component that is going to encode additional constraints uh, about the target domain. So for example, if you move to biology and you do name entity recognition, you want to know that hyphenated phrases are uh, legitimate and you know, stuff like that. Uh, and it turns out that this in itself, really doing very little, mm -hmm. uh, is significant. Because there was something <coughs> that you knew about the target domain and you just didn't know how to use it. You didn't have data. You just knew something about your expectation. And you can also take this objective function and plug it in in an iterative learning algorithm like constraint driven learning or something like that, and you will get more improvement. So I don't want to uh, talk about this. I want to end with uh, a few uh, minutes uh, talking about adaptation for text correction. <coughs> so, so this is really a cool task that not enough people in NLP are working on yet. Uh, so here are some examples. These are sentences that uh, people can write. Uh, he's an engineer with a passion to what he does, should be formed. Uh, laziness is the engine of <coughs> the progress. We don't need an article there. Uh, and the question is, how do we correct this? So, so really, from a machine learning perspective, it's a relatively easy task. Think about it as a multi-class classification task. Either you have a collection of articles, A, there, nothing, or a collection of propositions. Define features based on the context, select a machine learning algorithm, uh, and that's it. The question, of course, is how do we train? Specifically, what data do we use to train? And, and then we're going to make decisions, say one versus all decisions. So where is the difficulty? The difficulty is, is data. Oh, and, and by the way, I anticipate a question. This is the most common question. <coughs> yes, we're doing much better than language models. 10 to the 6 better. And by 10 to the 6, I mean the ratio of data. So. So what we, when we train on a million uh, examples, we're about the same as language model of size 10 to the 12. Uh, so, okay, so the key issue I want to focus on, and, and basically I'm just going to give examples or, or general paradigms, is 
how can we adapt a model like this to the first language of the writer? It turns <coughs> out that conceptually it's the same problem as context sensitive spelling that you know people including me have worked on you know ten years ago. But there is a very interesting twist to SLLs. And the twist is that non-native speakers make mistakes in a systematic manner. And these mistakes often depend on the first language of the speaker. And you know, many of you I'm sure <coughs> uh, in this audience are familiar with it. If you've read a lot of papers written by students, you're even more familiar with that. So, so the question is how can we adapt the model to the first language of the writer? Uh, so just to give you an idea about errors, so this is proposition error statistics by source language. Look at uh, Chinese and Czech, for example. A lot more preposition errors by Chinese writers than by Czech writers. Uh, and the way we model this is we model it with, with a notion of confusion set. So what you can see is a confusion matrix for some prepositions for Chinese speakers. So, so on is what was written in the text. And this is a distribution over what it could have come from. What should have been there. So with 85% probability, it actually is on. But the rest of the 15% could be something else, and we won't be able to figure out. So this is really an adaptation problem. In fact, we have a lot more types of mistakes. I don't know if you can read it, but you know, there's article, proposition, verb forms, noun number, you know, a lot of stuff. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk only about results of proposition and articles. I just want to point out that the number of sentences that we have annotated it's very small. It's very difficult to do. Uh, you really need to be an expert. Just native speaker isn't always enough in order to do it, and it, it's time consuming. So that leads to two possible training paradigms. The simple one says, you know, we have a lot of correct native English data. Take all of <coughs> Wikipedia. Whenever you see a proposition, drop the proposition, extract feature from the context, and learn a classifier. The other option would be to use data with, annotated with proposition errors, then I can see, oh, they wrote two there. So I'm going to use the source two as part of my features. Over there, I cannot use the source because it's always correct. And it turns out that this is a huge difference. You want to use the source because 85, 90, 95 percent, depending on the type of error, it's actually correct. Even people that make a lot of mistakes make only about 10 percent mistakes. So you really want to use it. So what are the paradigms? So one paradigm says, well, <coughs> I have a lot of data from Wikipedia. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to train on correct native data without any knowledge about typical error. The second one says, I'm going to use some knowledge about typical error in training, uh, but then I have very little data. So the adaptation problem is how to use one uh, in order to accomplish two. And uh, almost my last slide, uh, basically the idea, or the two ideas that we have here, is on how to use error statistics on the few annotated ESL sentences as a way to push a model that was learned on a lot of native uh, data uh, in the right direction. So. Basically, for each observed proposition, we have a distribution of a possible correction. This was taken from a very small set of uh, annotated sentences, but you know, it's, it's very simple statistics also, so it's, it could be very robust. So what can we do? There, there are really two adaptation schemes. One of them that you can apply on generative models, for example, on naive base. In naive base, you can train a single model for each proposition on native data. It doesn't matter what is the confusion set you care about? It's going to be the same model. And then, once you see a test sentence with a, a specific proposition, you're going to update the model, the model priors, based on the sole proposition and uh, their own statistics. So I'm going to change priors and then make a decision. When we do it discriminatively, we're not so lucky because we must <coughs> train a different model for each proposition and each confusion set. If you think about it a little bit, that's the key difference in terms of architecture between naive base and, and say, perceptron. Uh, you really depend on the confusion set. What would be negative examples? So 
we can't do this simple scheme, what we do instead, we actually noisify the training data according to the error statistics. So we take Wikipedia, whenever we see a proposition, with some probability we change it according to the confusion metrics that we estimated from the little annotated data we have. Now we have data that <coughs> we can train with the source feature included. And that's very, very important. It gives us a lot more information. The bottom line is that we get very, very significant improvements over training on training data with this. I must say that for the discrimi discriminative method, there are a few other complications that I don't want to get into because you really have very, very small percentage of negative examples. As I said, even when people make mistakes, they don't make that many mistakes. So you have to kind of deflate uh, one side, the, the one-sided data that you have a little bit, but still, uh, if you do it right, it actually is doing better than the general thing. Uh, okay, uh, I'm done. Uh, really what I wanted to say, that there's more to adaptation than just looking at f of x and f of y given x. Uh, and the key message where I think there's more uh, potential to continue is, really it's possible to adapt without retraining. So the examples that we've generated uh, gave us kind of a systematic way of changing the text to fit an existing model. But I think this is really preliminary and, and there's a lot more one can do uh, in this area. Uh, and my last point was that we need adaptation on other problems. And, and I think the ESL uh, problem uh, is one very, very challenging example. Uh, and I welcome all uh, <coughs> Thank you.